1928, if anyone requires it. So um, just to get started here, I just wanted to welcome everyone and thank you very much for coming to the 2019 Praise Guy Investor Day. We're, uh, we've now released our playbook, which sits in front of you. So uh, we're going to walk through the methodology of it and uh, you know what's in it and what's not in it. And um, we'll also highlight past accomplishments, you know, what, what have we accomplished over the last five years, um, asset values, and a range of outcomes for future returns. And I think you know, going through a lot of this would be a, a good overview of the company, and it's probably a little overdue. So before I get started, I just wanted to make a few introductions. Uh, Jim Esty, our chairman of the board, uh, is in attendance. Jim, if you could stand up, please. Um, Jim has been an integral part of the company since our inception. He spends his spare time at oil and gas conferences listening to how producers are allocating capital and uh, what they're focused on. Um, so he's been a great resource for us. And uh, he's taken all his compensation and praise guy shares since IPO. So thank you, Jim, for uh, your hard work and for attending. Uh, Margaret McKenzie, if you could stand up, please. So Margaret was the founder of her own royalty company, Range Royalty, which Prairie Sky acquired in 2014. And she then joined the board. Um, they used the global financial crisis to substantially grow their business when no one had capital available, and they did. So um, they built a very great business, and actually just uh, we, we keep track. Pam keeps track of every single acquisition we do separately in our financial accounting system so we can see how smart we were or where we were wrong. And that was the best performing asset uh, in our portfolio last year, and that's a result of uh, the Viking, mainly in Alberta, performing above expectations. Um, she's also the chair of our audit committee, so thanks for that. Um, Sheldon is a geologist. He's the chair of our reserves committee. Uh, so there's Sheldon in the back. We'll talk a little bit about reserves today, proved, uh, proved reserves. And uh, Sheldon uh, was a chief operating officer of Renaissance Energy when I started in the business in the late 90s. And he's also founded his own EMP. And uh, he sits on numerous industry boards as well as an advisor to a private equity fund, which provides Prairie Sky with good insights because we lease a lot of land to private equity backed uh, companies. So on to the presenters. Um, I'm going to introduce Maria first. Maria Rajic is a geologist with 20 years experience, uh, including most recently working in the Macquarie A&D group. Uh, prior to that, she worked at Encana. Um, she has amongst the highest contribution to the employee stock savings program in the company. 25% of her salary goes towards that. So sorry, I probably should have told you I was going to say that. But I think that says, says a lot about someone who looks under the hood every day and is that committed to, uh, uh, to that program. So thanks, Maria, for presenting. Uh, Amber Vitarik is our controller. She has been since December 2014. She's worked in the junior oil and gas business as well as at KPMG LLP. And uh, she does a very good job of closing the books. The auditors don't spend a ton of time in, uh, in our office. And she's going to walk through the accrual process and prior period adjustments. I know there's a lot of questions quarter over quarter on how that works and some of the nuances with it. So I, I think she'll, she's the one who puts those together. So I think she'll do a good job describing that. And then Jeff Leroy. Um, Jeff, if you could stand up. So Jeff's a geologist engineer, and uh, he's the key architect of this playbook. He's worked for over 30 years in the business. He's also worked on every single uh, A&D transaction that we've, uh, we've done since IPO. So uh, he's a great resource to talk to on the break if you're interested. And he, uh, you know, for every A&D transaction we consummated, there was 15 to 20 that we didn't buy. And, uh, but those were all done with full workups. Um, so we're happy we didn't buy those ones, and I think when you pay people at companies, uh, some of the things you pay them to do are the things they don't do. And I think if you had his full list of the things we didn't do, you'd be very pleased with uh, what we've done. So thank you, Jeff, and thanks for all your hard work on the playbook. Um, and then I, I don't have any formal introduction, but this is Cam and Pam, and they'll be <laughs> presenting as well. Sorry, that was, uh, we, we would have run out of time. And, and finally, we're very pleased to announce, and some of you may have caught it this morning, that we added a new board member today. We've added uh, Jane Gavin to our board of directors. She's the president of asset management at uh, Dream Unlimited Corp and the chief executive of Dream Global. She has over 30 years leadership and business experience. And Prairie Sky is effectively an underground REIT. Um, I know there's someone in this room here who described it as such uh, upon our IPO. And you know we're effectively an underground REIT that's half leased um, with no leverage. So we're going to compare ourselves to REITs a little later in the presentation because we do use them in our, in our peer groups, so I think it's important. And I think Jane will add great value to the Praise Guy board and all shareholders, so we're excited to have her join us. I think it's the only external board she's on, uh, very experienced. Um, quick overview of Praise Guy. Um, we're the biggest fee simple mineral title owner in Canada. We're focused on per share returns, and I'll talk all about the, uh, a lot about how we perform per share uh, later in the presentation. 
We have a very simple strategy. In good times, we build cash on top of the dividend buyback. And in challenging times, we upgrade the quality of our portfolio by acquiring royalties and undeveloped land below intrinsic value. Um, we have undeveloped land in all four provinces, which provides shareholders with a basket of call options on any new play discovery, any new technology, any new advancement uh, in secondary recovery. So, you know, one of the things you'll hear a lot about, um, especially if you read U.S. sales notes, is the new flavor du jour is returns to shareholders. So we've, we've actually returned real cash to shareholders, so, which we're proud of, and we'll talk a little bit about that quickly, but we're going to spend most of our time today focusing on future returns and future potential outcomes. Uh, we've paid $900 million in dividends. We've used $120 million to cancel shares that we'll never pay a dividend on again. $100 million of free cash flow has been reinvested in the business, so that equates to cash returns of 25% of our current market cap. So it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty good number given that oil has been down 40% since we IPO'd and natural gas is down 55%. So those are some pretty uh, remarkable headwinds. Um, so how has Prairie Sky evolved? Uh, you know, on, on the IPO, we had no Saskatchewan royalties. We had no Viking royalties, we were minimal. Um, no oil sands exposure, no Montney exposure, and no major scalable medium heavy oil resource play. Uh, so these are, this is the original uh, IPO land block. Um, we then acquired Range Royalty, which is another 3.5 million acres. Uh, that was followed by the Canadian Natural Resources $1.8 billion acquisition. And that was the oil sands. It looks very small, but again, these are, uh, this is 15.6 million acres, so anything looks small. This is 1,600 kilometers from our furthest royalty producing in southeast Saskatchewan, Manitoba, all the way to northeast BC. And then those, that last block that jumped in there was the Clearwater. So for scale, I should go back to that. that the Clearwater lands there that uh, jumped on that 750,000 acres. So it looks quite small when you're looking at a scale of uh, half of Canada, but it's, uh, it's a very big uh, resource base. So uh, what have we done in the past five years? And we're, we'll talk about the per share numbers next, but you've had cash returns of over a billion dollars. Uh, you own the biggest uh, Saskatchewan fee simple mineral title position, which we had, uh, again, not a sectional land in Saskatchewan on IPO. Uh, we're the, we have the biggest Viking royalty position in Canada. It's now a third of our oil production, 3,000 barrels a day of light oil of our 9,000 barrels of uh, royalty oil production. And it's the quickest payout, fastest cycle time light oil play in Canada. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that's evolved over the last two years. Um, we have two thermal oil sands projects uh, where we have royalties on all the undeveloped land surrounding them. So that'll provide you with duration in the uh, follow-on phases. Um, numerous Montney developments, uh, some we've acquired over the last two years. And then... Um, we took all the, uh, effectively the lease issuance bonus we got from the Duvernay and reinvested it uh, in the Clearwater. And now we're the, we have the largest royalty position in the Clearwater. And um, some of the recent land sales have gone for 50 times what Prairie Sky paid o uh, only a year and a half ago for this big land block. So uh, we're, we're pleased with that investment and it is the Canada's fastest growing oil play right now. Um, but, it, but it's one of those rare opportunities where you could take the one-time lease issuance bonus and reinvest it in perpetual royalties. So um, again, just a, a summary of all the acquisitions we've done since IPO. Uh, on the IPO, we issued 130 million shares, and that currently generates 35% of funds flow from operations. The next 104 million shares we issued generates today 65% of our funds flow from operations. So you know, it's been, this downturn has been very valuable for us. It's allowed us to get into plays that are, are seeing outsized activity today, and, and so we're proud of that, um, uh, that accomplishment. And then... Uh, you know, what you own in a business is your per share numbers, and there's acreage per share and free cash flow per share. And our acreage per share is up 68%. And, and while that doesn't feel that important in an undercapitalized basin where there's probably only 20 billion spent this year, um, as a recovery takes foot and we continue to get just under 5% uh, of total Canadian CapEx, we're well, uh, far better positioned per share uh, today than we were. And I would also highlight that the, going from 40,000 to 67,000 acres per million shares those next acres are uh, some of the most actively drilled uh, in the basin right now. So uh, we're pleased with those results. So I guess, I guess that means the IPO lands were no good. Um, there's the <laughs> Central Alberta Duvernay, and, and Marie is the expert on this, but you know, with the IPO lands, we got the Duvernay. And uh, I'd like to say we were smart enough to know that this play would emerge as Canada's premier light oil shale play, but w we didn't know. We, didn't, we knew it existed, but we didn't really know it had much value. We're just fortunate to own the surface deposit mineral rights. So this is a, a good description of why you like to own fee simple uh, mineral title because, again, you're never smart enough to know what the next player, next technology is. You just know you own it when it comes along. 
Um, today we have over a thousand, uh, hundred percent forever owned sections of land um, in the Duvernay. And uh, 10 sections of that thousand sections currently contributes five million a year in revenue uh, to the company from zero at IPO. And it's been growing at about a hundred percent compounded growth rate. Um, we are a function of total capex uh, spent on the lands, and you can see um, in 2014 we had $47 billion in total Canadian upstream capex, excluding oil sands, and that was enough to grow our business at 17% compounded annualized, which is almost a laughable, embarrassing number now when you think about um, we're praying for 2% growth, and I'll show you the range of outcomes at the end here, but, but again, we've seen capital continue to decline in Canada, but we do believe it'll come back. Canada's a competitive base, and we see a lot of our producers... Uh, doing fairly well, but we can grow or, or decline organically depending on this total capex, and it's one of the things that's uh, beyond our control. But our oil volumes have stayed uh, roughly flat for the last seven quarters with no acquisitions, and all, all the while there's been some of the lower, lowest capex numbers we've seen in 20 years in, in Western Canada. So we're pleased with that, and that's a function of us getting a slightly more than our normal share of, uh, of that capex. This is the first time I put this slide up, and it's just our 39,000 producing wells, so no undeveloped uh, locations, and it's just our proved plus probable res reserves. And it, it, I think it's an interesting way to think about prairie sky, and I think if you, if you really think about what this means, it's, uh, it, it's a good way to understand the business. So each one of these years, we produce about 8 million barrels of royalty production. And as we produce 8 million barrels from that proved plus probable reserve balance, we've uh, returned 899 million. And industry spent enough capital to almost fully replace that. And every year, our independently audited uh, reserve report has showed about 47 million barrels. Now, that can, if you go to $40 oil, that can decline by a few million barrels. Um, if we can get CapEx returning to more normalized levels, that should grow to over 50 million barrels. But it, it's an interesting business where um, you replace the entire 8 million barrels you produced uh, with other people's money. Um, and those who've heard me present before are probably sick of uh, seeing this chart. Uh, but again, the, I think it's very important to highlight the duration of the asset. And it's got 55 years on the x-axis, zero capex. And just since the Prairie Sky IPO, the arrow there, uh, we've done $1.1 in free cash flow. So there's very few businesses um, you know, that over five and a half decades generate this kind of cash um, while equity values maintained. So it's a, it's a very unique business from that standpoint. So um, I'll, I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about um, the methodology for developing those big, thick playbooks in front of you, um, what's in them and what's not, uh, before I let Maria highlight the, uh, some of our key plays. Um, but that little blue wedge at the bottom, that's our proved booked reserve. So that's the 39,000 producing well bores. And you'll notice that uh, our value we have in our reserve report is higher than what we've put in our published in our playbook. And that's just because Prairie Sky uses a more conservative price deck than our reserve evaluator does. So, so that's, again, just the book proved reserves, uh, the blow down value of the business. The next orange wedge is kind of you know, something like what a producer would book, uh, five-year trailing type curves, well-defined productive trends, and mostly just infills and step-out locations. And that's where you get the $15.2 billion of total value when you add the orange and the light blue. But, but the real reason you own royalties is for that navy wedge. And interestingly enough, since the 2017 playbook that we published, 10% of the drilling, so over 150 wells, has uh, happened in that navy blue wedge, things we couldn't have predicted uh, a few years ago. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about you know, why acquisitions can be difficult, because we believe every time you do an acquisition, you're selling your asset and you're buying another one. So you really do need to understand what you own and what's under the hood of your own asset before you acquire something else. And most of the assets that we've seen recently would have a very strong component of that light blue wedge at the bottom little bit of orange and zero navy blue. So we'd get some accretion near term, but it would dilute our business and dilute our shareholders over the long term. So further on to the methodology, um, this is, uh, again, how we develop those values. We use the exact same methodology we did in the 2017 playbook. So if you're comparing one to the other, um, they're identical in terms of how we did this. And we actually summarize it for you in this playbook, uh, the differences uh, over the last two years. Um, the orange area here is the proven productive trend. So it's only areas with recent drilling where there's proven wells directly offsetting it where we've booked these, uh, the value, that $15.2 billion of undiscounted value. The blue is the outline of proven production. And, you know, we do think there's potential there, but we don't uh, book any potential future reserves there. And the reason for that is just because there hasn't been recent drilling. 
So as drilling picks up, some of, uh, some of this other acreage should come into play. So this is the asset summary um, that you'll see in both your playbook and your uh, flip book for today. Um, it's a $15.2 billion undiscounted value. Uh, this year, for the next forevermore, we use $60 USWTI, and we wrote down our gas to $1.50 forever. Now, we don't necessarily believe that gas can stay at $1.50 forever because the lowest cost producers in Canada, uh, their full cycle funding and development plus transportation costs are above that. Um, so unless gas becomes just a derivative of the liquids plays, um, we do think that has to improve. But uh, as a result of that, we've taken 14,000 natural gas locations out of our playbook this year that we had in in 2017. So I'll summarize that a little later. Uh, the top five plays by value are listed here, uh, two of which Marie is going to do a deeper dive on, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. And the one new addition is the Clearwater play. And it doesn't play a big role in value in this addition, but we think it'll be near the top of all of our assets in the next three, five, and 10 years. It's a very important part of the company. Um, so this highlights some of the changes from the last playbook and the last time we issued this. And there's six kind of major changes. Uh, one would be expansion of play boundaries, so that's a positive. Two is acquisitions, which I'll talk about another positive. New discoveries, leveraging technology, land fund arrangements, and then the negative, which is price changes. So the Saskatchewan Vikings are most actively drilled play, and it's on the upper left. And there's, uh, I think, 600 wells were drilled in our Saskatchewan Vikings since we last issued the playbook. Uh, but because of expansion of the play boundaries by industry, we've added 900 wells. So we've actually net added 300 new locations to this asset. Now, that can't happen forever, and it is a little more mature on the curve. So we think the additive years are probably maybe one or two more playbooks before it starts to see our inventory decline. But that has expanded over the last two years. Um, acquisitions, the Montney, we've added 35,000 uh, acres with proven production. Uh, mostly in two rivers and some, we have a little bit of acreage in Pipestone, but I, th I think this will uh, be important as gas returns to a, a little more normalized levels. Uh, three is new discoveries. There was some significant uh, light and heavy oil discoveries made in Leduc, um, as well as Thorsby and Kalmar, and we think those will be big additions to the playbook value in future years. And, and the next one is leveraging technology, and the last time we presented the playbook, we had a trailing drilling activity or spuds on Prairie Sky Land in Alberta of 10 Viking wells in 2016, and this last year we had 171 wells. And a lot of those were on the range royalty assets that I mentioned earlier. Um, so that's just a function of producers taking the technology and the learnings from Saskatchewan and bringing them uh, onto the Alberta side. So that's added a huge amount of value and a huge amount of future drilling locations. And I think we've already had, uh, Pam, 50 plus licenses uh, on the play this year. So we expect another very actively drilled year. Um, Marie is going to talk a little more about the Clearwater, so I won't go into the land fund arrangements. And then price changes. Obviously, the big negative is we removed 14,000 gas locations from the playbook, so there's zero future value attributed to those. Fortunately, we own the fee forever, so they're not gone forever. As pricing improves, um, they should return. So the net result is we've added 8% growth in undiscounted value from the last playbook, 16% growth in future oil locations. We've maintained 100% of our externally booked proven uh, plus probable reserves uh, while returning half a billion dollars to shareholders, and we've had 1,500 new wells uh, on production. So um, again, methodology and summary, this is where we've gained and lost by value, commodity, and play. And I think what we wanted to do is just really highlight the differences from the last time we published this playbook, where we were wrong, where things have worked out better, and where pricing has taken future value off. So we've kind of done the analysis for you, um, but if you have your old playbook, you can uh, double check that, but we used five-year trailing type curves. We used actual accounting data for pricing and offsets, so that allows us to make sure the values are realistic, and we applied flat pricing. So we used, again, $60 WTI um, and then the $1.50 ACO uh, to get these values. So we've net removed 11,000 locations. Uh, we've increased our potential reserves by 22 million barrels. Now, interest for context, we produce about eight a year, so in the last two years, uh, again, our business has organically added that 22 million um, which is just under three years of uh, future production. And we've added $1.2 in undiscounted value, net of the half a billion lost to pricing. So I'm going to now turn it over to Maria to talk about our feature plays. And uh, she can kind of walk through the Clearwater, the Viking, and the Duvernay. Thank you, Andrew, and good morning, everyone. 
I'm very excited about this opportunity to present additional information on three of Prairie Sky's feature plays today. I will be walking you through the Viking Oil, Duvernay, and Clearwater Oil plays that are part of Prairie Sky's extensive portfolio. Together, these feature plays make up almost 50% of Prairie Sky's undiscounted future potential value. These three plays also cover almost 20% of Prairie Sky's 15.6 million acres of royalty lands. These plays highlight assets that are at different stages of development, which are all important components to Prairie Sky's extensive and diversified asset portfolio. The Viking Oil play, located in East Central Alberta and into Western Saskatchewan, is an example of a play in full stage development mode and accounts for $4.3 billion of undiscounted future potential value in the 2019 royalty playbook. The Duvernay in Central Alberta falls within our early to intermediate stage development and accounts for $2.1 billion of undiscounted future potential value. Our emerging or early stage play, the Clearwater Heavy Oil Play in North Central Alberta, currently accounts for a little over $200 million of undiscounted future potential value. It is also important to note that we have included development only on a small portion of the Clearwater royalty lands and expect this value will grow significantly as the play matures. The first feature play I'll be focusing on today is the Viking Oil Play in East Central Alberta and Western Saskatchewan. Price Sky's Viking Oil assets averaged a total of about 3,500 barrels of oil equivalent per day from these asset areas in 2018. As Andrew mentioned, if you consider the company's total oil production in 2018, the Viking made up a third of this total. So it is definitely a core asset for the company. Prairie Sky has over 1.2 million acres of royalty lands within our uh, Viking play areas. Just under 900 wells were drilled on royalty lands from 2017 to 2018. And in Saskatchewan, this accounts for about 30% of all the industry activity in the Viking. And on the Alberta side, that accounts for about 40% of the industry activity. Prairie Sky has over 9,500 future locations in inventory, providing many years of sustainable drilling which I will expand upon in the next few slides. A new addition from the previous playbook is Prairie Sky's acquisition of additional Viking Gores in the greater Provost area in East Central Alberta in the fourth quarter of 2017. The acquisition added incremental Gores over approximately 90 sections of land. In total, 160 wells have been drilled on these lands since the acquisition. While the majority of the drilling has been in units, about 10% of this activity has occurred on new Gore lands, which is great to see in just over a year since the acquisition occurred. Technology advancements continue to expand the extent of the play, and I'll go into more detail on that next. For the Viking, key technology advancements, including monobore drilling, multi-stage fracturing techniques, and enhanced oil recovery schemes, such as water flooding, have contributed to the low risk low-cost, repeatable results characteristic of this play on both sides of the provincial border. Monoboard drilling and efficient completion techniques have helped keep costs under $1 million per well for the play and also contribute to the spud to on-production timing being as short as 20 to 30 days. With the low-risk drilling opportunities, low per-well capital requirements, superior economic returns, and short cycle times, it's not surprising to see the high level of industry activity within the play even in lower price environments. When you look at Prairie Sky's Viking land position in Saskatchewan, along with recent industry activity, which you see on the top right map, you can see how the drilling has been spread out across the extensive fairway and not localized in just a few small areas. Approximately 600 wells have been drilled on Prairie Sky lands over the last two years, which as I mentioned, makes up 30% of all industry activity, Viking activity in Saskatchewan. Operators have been able to expand the play into new areas that hadn't previously been developed with horizontal technology. Numerous pool extensions have occurred over the past two years, and it has expanded Prairie Sky's development acreage, which has subs subsequently added new infill and step-out locations to our future inventory. We're also seeing continued advancements in water flooding techniques being utilized for the Viking. In the greater Doddsland area, the number of ejection wells and total fluid injection more than doubled over the last two years. You can see on the map in the lower left the recent progression of water flood activity. 
The Wells and Blues are horizontal injector, injectors that were in place when Prairie Sky's 2017 playbook was published. And in the last two years, the wells in orange have commenced injection. While water floods may not ultimately be implemented everywhere across the fairway, there are indications that horizontal injections could be providing a more efficient sweep of the reservoir and better pressure maintenance. While it is still in early stages of the implement, implementation of horizontal wells for water flooding in the Viking, if you look at um, where horizontal water flooding has been implemented elsewhere, like the view-filled Bakken, for example, that may be a good analog for what ultimately occurs in the Viking. While we see this progression occurring in the field, the 2019 Royalty Playbook does not capture any future value associated with incremental recoveries realized through water flooding or other enhanced oil recovery schemes. On the other side of the border into Alberta, you see a related progression occurring where historical water flooding of underlying conventional sands are providing pressure support to the oily upper Viking sandstone, now being targeted with horizontal drilling. The Provost Veteran Viking Sea Unit, which has seen well over 100 new horizontals drilled since 2018, is a good example of where this is occurring. Pressure maintenance, whether capitalizing on existing water floods or implementing new schemes, is expected to be an important component in future development of the play. Again, no future value has been assigned to increased recoveries on the Alberta side either. So for the Viking, uh, we've provided a, an inventory snapshot here, again, comparing where we were in 2017 uh, to where we are now. So for the 2017 Royalty Playbook, we had a total of 8,500 locations across the Viking oil uh, assets. Uh, in the last two years, 2017 to 2018, about 900 uh, new drills have been drilled. So that would leave us with about 7,600 locations remaining if nothing else had changed over the last two years. But because of new drilling, expanding the development areas, and new acquisitions, Prairie Sky has been able to add over 1,900 locations in inventory. So we are up and at 750 locations in central Alberta and 300 locations in western Saskatchewan. The 2019 Royalty Playbook now has over 9,500 locations in inventory. So if you estimate about a similar drilling pace on the Saskatchewan side over what we've seen for the last two years and a slightly increased yearly pace of development on the Alberta side, Prairie Sky has about 20 years of drilling inventory to support long-term sustainable oil production from these assets. Going a bit further into the methodology we used in the playbook, on the upper right is a comparison of Prairie Sky's weighted average booked reserves for the Viking based on new wells drilled over the last two years. And this totals about 84,000 BOEs of ultimate recovery per well. For comparison, we have used, on average, about 60,000 barrels of oil equivalent ultimate recovery per well in the playbook. To further understand the play methodology that was used for the majority of the assets in the royalty playbook, I wanted to walk you through this Viking example in a little more detail. So you can see some of the play acreages on the lower uh, right side of your screen. And um, the play acreage, and you can also see them in the book um, on the play asset summaries. So these have been defined by areas in proximity to known occurrences of hydrocarbon. The development acreage, which is what we've used to estimate future lo location inventory, is a subset of the play area. It is determined by lands on or, where on or near where development has occurred in the play from 2010 to 2018, and represents lands where we anticipate drilling to occur next. On the Saskatchewan side, the recent horizontal activity has expanded the development fairway. So uh, in the 2017 Royalty Playbook, we had 76% of the play acreage included in our location inventory. And because of the expanded development, that is now up to 85%. In comparison, on the Alberta side, less than half of the play area has been included in the future development area. With continued drilling, there is ample room for incremental locations to be added to Prairie Sky's future location inventory, again supporting the long-term sustainability of drilling within the play. The second play featured today is the Duvernay Shale in central Alberta. 
Price Guys Duvernay assets averaged about 160 barrels of oil equivalent per day in 2018, and Prairie Sky has over 900,000 acres of royalty lands, predominantly fee land. The high concentration of fee land within the fairway is significant, as Prairie Sky typically receives higher royalty percentages on these lands. About 50 wells were drilled on royalty lands from 2017 to 2018, and you can see on the map on the left of the screen the progression of the play on Prairie Sky royalty lands over the past few years. This map encompasses about 100 miles in an east-west uh, direction and 130 miles in a north-south direction. On the very southeast portion of the map, which is commonly referred to as the Ghost Pine Embayment or Wimborne Subbasin, Prairie Sky had only one royalty well on production at the end of 2016, and there's one well in green on the map there. You can see the expansion of the play in this area on royalty lands from this data point with the orange wells coming on production in the last two years, 2017 to 2018, and the yellow wells that had been rig released by the end of 2018 but not placed on production yet. You see somewhat similar progressions throughout the Signet or Westerdale embayment in the central portion of the map and into the West Shale Basin west of the Leduc Rimby Reef Trend. New activity on Prairie Sky lands has been spread out over the fairway. Proven oil production has now been established over a larger area. While there are areas where development style drilling programs have started to be implemented in the Duvernay, especially in the Signet area, it is important to note that over the past two years, a large portion of the activity has also been focused on further delineation drilling throughout the extensive fairway, gathering additional core, log, and other technical data to further advance the play. There are areas where operational efficiencies that come with more concentrated pad style development programs haven't yet been established. And we see that continuing to become a more important progression along the play as it continues to mature. With the large fee land position, Prairie Sky holds the majority of the lands in perpetuity. The shorter term timing risk that operators must consider on undeveloped lands does not apply to Prairie Sky on its fee land. In fact, it can be a benefit as lands that are not developed within the primary lease periods can be released to industry. So some of the technology advancements definitely continue to unlock the potential in the Duvernay. In the last two years, industry has moved towards longer laterals, increased frack stages and profit tonnages, and tighter interwell spacing. These advancements have contributed to improvements in well productivity. Because the Duvernay is not as far along in the development in other assets, like the Viking, for example, Prey Sky has continued to use a modified approach to assessing locations and future value to this play. For the 2019 Royalty Playbook, Prairie Sky has estimated four extended reach horizontals or two mile laterals for every two sections of land. We have applied this density to 50% of the acreage within the play area. It is important to note that there are existing field examples where industry has already applied a den densities far greater than this approach. If you take the map on the left, for example, you see Prairie Sky land in navy blue, offset by crown and other freehold land. This is typical of the checkerboard position we have within the play. There's roughly four and a half sections of prairie sky land on this map. If you take our current methodology and account for four wells for every two sections on only 50% of this acreage, that works out to about four and a half net horizontals in total being identified on prairie sky lands using this approach. If you contrast this with what has actually already occurred in the field in this example, at an interwell spacing that indicates up to 12 wells per two sections. These same four and a half prairie sky sections could ultimately see 27 net horizontal wells drilled, a six-fold increase than what we're using as our current methodology for the lands shown here. So while there's significant undiscounted future potential value currently be assi being assigned to this play, there are many considerations where this number can continue to grow over time. La longer laterals, Larger fracks and tighter frack spacing have contributed to improvements in well productivity. While many advancements have been made, we expect continued to progression of the technology used to develop this vast resource. For example, the total number of frack stages has already progressed from about 20 stages early on to 40 per well and can continue to increase, increase um, especially when you compare it to some of the completions being utilized in the U.S. shale basins. 
Over the last two years, industry has begun testing the potential for stacked Duvernay benches as well. As this is still in early stages, Prairie Sky has not captured the potential for stacked Duvernay development in the 2019 royalty playbook, but it remains a significant opportunity for, for the future. I think there's six wells. Yeah, so six wells have been drilled, and uh, so industry has recognized uh, the potential there. So we're excited about that for the next royalty playbook. So again, a, a DuVernay sh snapshot of where we were in 2017 compared to today. Uh, we did have about 1,400 locations in the 2017 Royalty Playbook. We still have included 1,400 uh, locations in the 2019 Royalty Playbook. The split is a little different, uh, 1,150 locations on the fee because of the drilling that has taken place to date, and 200, 250 Gore locations. Uh, the increase is largely due to increased acquisitions within the, within the area. So if you take a uh, future development of about 50 wells per year, that leaves us with uh, 30 years presently of remaining development on the area. One note on the type curve utilized for the 2019 Royalty Playbook is that we've used a type curve ultimate recovery of 310,000 barrels of oil equivalent per well, which is below our average booked reserves ultimate recovery which is also lower than some type curve estimates being utilized by industry for the Duvernay. The final play I'll be featuring is the Clearwater Heavy Oil play in North Central Alberta. It is a new addition to Prairie Sky's portfolio from the previous 2017 playbook. 2018 royalty production averaged 30 barrels of oil per day, which is growing into 2019. Prairie Sky has 755,000 acres of gore land in the play. The majority of these gore lands are 15-year oil sand leases, providing an extended period to fully evaluate and develop the potential on these lands. Currently, we have a mix of early stage development and exploration opportunities with significant growth potential beyond what has been captured today in the playbook. The 725 locations in inventory are focused in the Nipissee area, which is the blue circle highlighted on your map. Remaining exploration lands provide opportunities for significant gro growth beyond what has been captured. Multilateral horizontal drilling has been a key technical advancement for the Clearwater. I'll wait till, uh, till the slides back up. There we go. Based on results to date, the multilaterals are proving to be highly successful in obtaining oil production from the Clearwater Sands. The multilaterals being drilled typically have four to six legs. I'm seeing definitely more six-leg laterals drilled from one well at the surface. One six-leg multilateral can have over 7,000 meters of reservoir rock drilled. Rock properties in the Clearwater, including the reservoir's in situ porosity and permeability, are high enough that multi-stage fracturing is not required for the wells to produce in economic quantities. With no fracture stimulation required, drill and complete costs are low, under $1 million per well, and contribute to the high capital efficiencies of the play. The map on the lower left is a zoom in of the Nipissee area, which encompasses about 13% of Prairie Sky's Clearwater Gore land position. This is the area where Prairie Sky has allocated all of the 725 future locations included in the 2019 Royalty Playbook. Every time I go into the software to refresh this map, there's new industry activity occurring, and you can see how much the play has progressed in just a few years. The wells in orange depict Clearwater activity from 2017 to 2018, and the wells in green show the drilling activity that has already occurred to date in 2019. The blue wells are licensed locations that have not yet been drilled. These multilateral pad sites commonly have been built to accommodate numerous multilaterals from one surface location. So you can get a lot of development from one surface pad site. The map on the lower left, the map on the lower right, sorry, is an even closer zoom in of the existing development in Nipsey. In addition to new drilling, the operators also initiated a water flood pilot in the area. The large oil in place with low recoveries make the Clearwater a good candidate for secondary recovery schemes. 
which could further extend the low decline, long reserve life potential of the Clearwater. While no future value has been assigned to the exploration lands outside of the Nipissee area in the 2019 Royalty Playbook, the acreage is highly prospective for Clearwater heavy oil development. Nine wells have already been drilled on exploration lands to date, and there are currently two additional licensed locations on these lands. The image on the upper right corner is an example well logged through the Clearwater on exploration lands. The depths on this core are from about 375 to 460 meters below surface, very shallow. The intervals colored in yellow highlight four different clear water sand packages, and one has already been targeted horizontally. As development matures and infrastructure gets built out, we are excited about the stacked potential of the clear water on exploration lands. So for the clear water inventory snapshot, 2017 Royalty Playbook, no clear water locations were included. Of the 20 new drills on Prairie Sky lands over the past two years, 19 of those were in 2018. 725 locations have been included in the 2019 Royalty Playbook from the Nipissee area alone, which covers only 13% of Prairie Sky's total Goreland position in the play. Assuming 50 wells per year of drilling activity, we've captured 15 years of development from the Nipsey area alone. With uh, 14 spuds in Q1 2019 on Prairie Sky lands to date, development for the current year has been occurring at about this 50 wells per year pace. As the play matures and new productive areas are confirmed, the pace of development and associated production ads could increase substantially in comparison to the rate of activity to date. So in conclusion, for the three plays featured today and throughout our extensive portfolio, Price Guy's assets are well positioned for future growth. This large inventory of future locations supports the long-term sustainability of Prairie Sky's business model. New technology, it continues to unlock new reserves and help re improve recoveries. Development areas, the methodology we employ for the majority of our assets ties development areas to recent activity. It acts as a proxy for where we feel drilling will occur next. The methodology typically leaves a lot of room for incremental growth in drilling inventories beyond what has been, been captured in the playbook. Acquisitions and land funds have also further strengthened play acreage totals and future location inventories since the 2017 playbook. And finally, Prairie Sky's diversified portfolio of future growth opportunities is spread out over multiple plays at various stages of development, which again points to the long-term sustainability of our business model. So that concludes the feature plays portion of the presentation and brings us to our morning break. So I think we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes at 10 o'clock. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, so the second half, we're gonna talk a little bit about the land picture, and then Amber, our controller, is gonna talk about prior period adjustments and accruals. Pam's gonna go through royalty production revenue, some financial matters, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, everyone's favorite topic, uh, valuation, and then returns. Um, so before I get talking about the mineral title position across Western Canada and our portfolio, I just wanna talk about a couple things quickly. Uh, we don't have a slide on this. The first is ESG. Uh, we have an ESG report, or corporate responsibility report, uh, that's on the table. Uh, this is a document that we started working on about three and a half years ago. This is our second iteration. Uh, light on the E, because we don't have abandonment liabilities, we don't have surface locations, we don't own pipelines. So the environmental component of our business is much smaller than you would expect in, in the energy business. Uh, a little bit heavier on the S and the G obviously, but this is something that Pam and I worked on along with our team uh, for the last couple of years. So take a look through it. There's quite a bit of information there. It's something we take quite seriously. Uh, we actually do have KPIs, uh, one, three, and five-year goals for our organization that are built into our compensation. So it's something that uh, we're ahead of the curve on and we're spending a lot of time on. Jim and I actually attended an ESG conference here in Toronto yesterday, put on by Scotia, and I think Pat Bryden's here somewhere. Uh, it was an excellent uh, excellent conference, very well attended. Some of you in this room were there. Um, so I'd encourage all of you to, uh, to attend that in the future if you can. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is our staff. Uh, if you've met with us in the past, 
very proud of our organization, very proud of our culture. Uh, Andrew and I were laughing at the break um, when we joined this business five years ago uh, and led the IPO and the spin out from Encana. Uh, we came out here for the listing ceremony and we watched the BNN feed and someone said, oh, this is a wonderful business. These guys just sit, and sit at their desks and collect checks, feet up on the desks. And it hasn't quite been like that the last five years. Um, we've reduced the headcount uh, from 85 at the time of the IPO to 60 today. Uh, a lot of that is using technology, embracing uh, new systems, new methodologies, uh, and just really getting more efficient across the organization. So we're extraordinarily proud of our group. Uh, they all embrace our corporate culture, and that's running a long-term uh, business, running it efficiently, and investing at the bottom points of the cycle in both assets and technology and new people. And I think having you know, some of our staff here today to participate in this, they were a big part of building both the ESG book as well as the asset book, uh, and as well as doing all the evaluations on acquisitions as well as leasing, which we're going to talk about here. So uh, we're extremely proud of them. Um, the other thing that we're very, very proud about is share ownership in our business. We talk a lot about why management and the board have invested $80 million of our own money in this business. Our staff have invested $7.3 million of their own money uh, in this business over the last five years. So uh, Jim's clapping at the back. Um, it's a big part of our culture. We want our staff to think like owners first and think long-term like, like management does, and uh, hopefully some of the shareholders in this room do as well. Uh, so we'll go through the mineral title position in, in Western Canada and try to explain why our business is, is both different from competitors uh, in Canada as well as, uh, as the U.S. So I'm going to advance some slides, and I apologize, I don't have a bouncing oil sands logo that goes on this. Um, this is the fee title position that's owned by roughly 162,000 uh, individuals and corporations. Uh, 100 thousand individuals actually in this map. A lot of this is actually in the shield or it's in the potash region, so it's not prospective for oil and gas. Uh, we do try and consolidate some of this from time to time. We advertise in papers across Western Canada. It's a very, very uh, onerous job. Not everyone looks at uh, trying to acquire a fee because you're often looking at you know, something that great, great, great granddad and grandmother owned and it's been passed down through generations, so it's split both either by substance or across uh, across an estate, um, but we do do the work, we have a system for it, and we do acquire some title from time to time. Uh, this is Exxon, uh, 1.1 million acres, uh, we've called them, uh, they've told us that they have a longer term horizon than Prairie Sky does, so uh, unlikely that transacts. Uh, this is Heritage Royalty, um, so this was sold by Synovus in 2015 for $3.3 .3 billion. Uh, and Terra Teachers owns it. Uh, it's a wonderful asset, fits very well with our other, uh, the other portion of the fee. One thing I would notice, it's 4.8 million acres, 1.1 million acres of this uh, in the Lloydminster heavy oil area is under a long-term lease to Husky for zero royalties forever. So uh, it's not a deal that Teachers did or Synovus did, but it's, um, it's a reminder as to why you don't do long-term leases at low royalties uh, forever. This is the Gore layer, and we're not giving that out to the analysts in, uh, in case you're going to ask about that. And then this is the fee. Um, and this is really why uh, but I tell you something, if this Cam and I have invested a large portion of our net worth in this business. Uh, it's a wonderful asset, something that's um, completely irreplaceable. They haven't made any new fee for uh, 100 years or more. Um, so of the mineral title position in Western Canada, about 90% is owned by the Crown, 10% is owned in these blocks. Um, but again, a lot, of it's, a lot of the Crown stuff is under parks and then also First Nations or it's uh, in uh, natural habitats that aren't available for posting. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, leasing. And this is really the engine that drives our business and I think what makes Prairie Sky different um, we have proprietary seismic over a large portion of our land base, which helps our technical team do prospecting on it uh, and get the hand get um, lands into the hands of of uh, producers out there. Uh, so we're going to talk about three different areas. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about is the Duvernay. Everyone loves to talk about the Duvernay. Um, it's a great asset, something we didn't value 
at the time of the IPO, but it's been a very pleasant surprise in our portfolio and feel it's a growth, growth asset going forward. Um, so this is, over the last two years, we've done a number of leasing uh, transactions. Not all the leasing transactions are shown in the orange on the map. Um, some of them are excluded for confidentiality reasons, but this orange blob represents around 11, 11 different transactions, 300,000 acres, um, and about $40 million of bonus. The royalty rates on these, and I'm going to show the comparable crown uh, in the next layer, uh, are 15% to 17.5%. There are some near-term incentives for the exploration wells, the first handful of wells. The thesis there was uh, we feel comfortable giving some minor royalty reduction up front, uh, knowing that when these get into full development mode uh, and the real capital is spent, it'll be spent at the higher royalty rate. So there are some smaller royalties at 12.5% um, that typically uh, go up to 15 or 17.5% after a time period or after a certain cumulative production from the well. Uh, these are all subject to individual negotiation. We have three landmen who work extraordinarily hard in our business to get these lands leased out. Um, the one thing that I would highlight that's very different from Crown is that we tend to have shorter terms. Most of the leases from the Crown are, are five years uh, with a little bit of a royal, lower royalty rate. We do shorter terms, which we feel incentivizes near-term activity, but we also bake in, uh, typically in this area, we've baked in uh, extension bonuses. Uh, so there's typically a drilling hurdle to even get to the option to extend the lands, which are, are escalated bonuses. So uh, we're starting to see some of those uh, extension bonuses come through, uh, and over the next two years, we have good visibility to either seeing those extension bonuses come back or getting land back into inventory and then being able to release it to industry. And then this is the offsetting crown. Um, higher world, or higher bonus, about 240 million in crown bonuses in here. Lower royalty rate, um, but obviously quite a bit more, more land. And just for everyone's reference, I think Maria talked about this in the presentation. Uh, most of these wells are actually drilled over two sections uh, now. So producers are looking at the royalty rate as a bit of a blend between, uh, between the crown and, and the fee. Okay, not as exciting, but fairly impactful uh, Manville leasing. And we talk a lot about Manville. It's a, it, it is a high value asset in our portfolio. It doesn't look like much against our land base, but generated uh, $2.5 million in bonus over the last couple of years, higher royalties um, and short primary terms. Um, again, we do have drilling hurdles and extension bonuses as well. Um, and one thing I would note in here is that uh, we talk a lot about the multi-zonal nature of, of these lands. Um, there are actually other zones that we've leased in here under separate leasing transactions to separate operators for both the Banff and the NISCU and other zones. So, uh, so we are breaking up the stack and leasing it out to different parties in the same area and in a lot of cases on the same section of land. And then here's the offsetting crown, quite a bit more land. Uh, uh, our bonus tended to be a little bit higher um, and then a little bit lower royalty rate. And then the Viking. Um, we've talked a lot about the Viking. It's a wonderful asset. We feel very fortunate to have acquired uh, this through range royalty and then also CNRL. Um, we didn't have any Viking at the time of the IPO in Saskatchewan. Uh, but it is something that's seeing leasing activity over the last, last number of years. So again, 90 sections of land, uh, shorter primary terms, because typically the, the operators are getting after the land quickly, so they don't need longer terms. And bonus is about 1.5 million, and then 17.5% is the standard rack rate on the Viking, because it really is uh, a development play, although some of these lands are pushing uh, play extensions out, which we'll talk about, I think, in 2021 when we, when we redo the playbook. And then the offsetting crown here layered in as well. So. One thing I do want to make very clear is that on the Crown leases, uh, typically they're, they're multi-zonal stacks that are leased from the Crown. Uh, Prairie Sky, since the IPO, has really gone to a zonal leasing strategy. And part of the thesis for that is that if someone wants the deep Devonian or the Duvernay, we're not going to give them the uphold zones uh, for free. Uh, that's our optionality that we like to keep in our portfolio. And as wells get drilled down into deeper zones, ultimately 
we get all the data that comes with those drills and so we can use that to prospect on our lands and continue this cycle of re releasing both lands that come back into inventory but also the uphole zones uh, as they drill through and provide us with that data. Typically we work with the producers who hold the deeper zones to give them those uphole zones uh, but they don't always want them. Sometimes they're very specialized in just chasing one thing. Okay, we're going to talk a little about uh, recycling the land. And this is a really, really important part of our business. Um, it's something that we think generates the best returns, our ability to break up old leases, get lands back into inventory, and then immediately flip them out. Now, this isn't something where we sit around at our desks like people at BNN say and uh, wait for things to come back. We're actively looking at our land, and we have a very clear idea of when terms are coming up, what lands are coming back, and so we proactively work with our technical team uh, to work up the data, work up new posters, contact very early uh, potential clients who might want to release this land, whether it's the incumbent or, or new, uh, new entrants, and get those lands back out early. So I'll talk about two different areas. The first one's weed land, the second one will be lock end. Um, this was the Manitoc deal. Um, we don't like this deal for a number of reasons. Uh, the primary one is it was done before the IPO, and so any bonus went to Encana. Um, but really, it was too much land in the hands of an operator who was undercapitalized, too many commitments. Uh, it was a very, very large piece of land, um, and it's something that you as a shareholder bought at the IPO. Um, so we did a lot of work to break this up. Um, we ultimately, and I'll just show... We broke up the lease through two different, different negotiations on compliance. Um, we brought back into inventory uh, 320 of the 360 sections. And in conjunction with that, we, had, we got $2.5 million in cash. We got additional gores from their portfolio in Williston Green and Stolberg, perspective for the Cardium as well as other zones. And we got proprietary seismic. And in exchange, we reduced our capital commitment. Um, subsequently, we broke up more land before they went into receivership, and uh, ultimately that process is wrapping up right now. Um, but what we did on the back end of that very quickly is we released um, in four different transactions uh, about 420 sections. Now that's, that's from a total perspective, but those were four different deals done for four different zones to four different producers. Um, the Wabam and Banff, Manville, Pekisco, including new exploration targets, which, which we love in, in our business. Um, there's been about six, six wells drilled uh, since we broke that up um, late last year and early part of this year, and an additional two wells that are licensed. Bonus is $1.5 million, although that's gone up because we're closing a deal this morning with, um, for a handful of sections for around $600,000 with the producer who bought some of the assets at a receivership. So there's more, more work to be done here on the block. And this is lock end. Um, so for anyone who uh, has been to Calgary or talked to Andrew, um, he goes up to this area from time to time. So I'll offer up his services if anyone wants a field tour to go just a little bit northwest of the city. I think he went up there about a couple months ago, took our two land guys who both look like linebackers, and then our legal counsel, who's a pretty big guy, and rented a Prius with BC license plates and drove up to lock end and oh. drove around. Not on purpose, okay. <laughs> Pam tells me we didn't actually have to buy the Prius at the end of it, so that was a positive. But, um, but this was a deal that uh, then in Canada did again. Um, the reason we didn't like it, it was just very long, nine years. Um, it was a, a lot of land, a lot of committed capital. Um, prospective mostly for the Cardium, although the leases were given for multiple zones. So this year... Uh, we broke that up and get it, got to end of term. Uh, they kept only 10 sections with the retained zones being uh, just the producing zones. And then immediately after that, we did three transactions uh, for 10 and a half sections, cardium only, bonus, about 1.2 million, including rentals. Um, one thing I would note is that as it was getting close to the end of the nine year term, the operator got busy. So this actually was a bit of a growth asset for us. Um, applying new technology in 2018 as opposed to the last sets of wells really being drilled in 2014 and 2015, but really being stagnated for a period of time. 
Um, no new wells drilled in this land yet. This has only been leased out for a handful of months, um, although there is one license already. One thing I would note is that there's no offset waiver in these leases. The operators know that. Um, there's been one well drilled on the offsetting lands um, with six more licenses, so this is going to trigger offsets. So what's going to happen there, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with offsets, is you know, one, we'll get wells drilled to satisfy those offsets, which could trigger more offsets. Uh, we could get comp comp compensatory royalties, which are our favorite because you get a royalty payment as if the well is drilled but the resource lays in the ground still. Uh, we could renegotiate these leases with the producers to get extension, which we could get bonus or commitments as well, or we could get land back into inventory, uh, which we could then lease to the multiple competitors that are drilling in this area. So. Um, so that's kind of an example of why we really like the fee land. These are just a couple examples of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and where we think we can continue to generate year over year new prospects, new bonus, new rentals, and new royalty revenue streams on this very, very extensive land base. For indicative purposes, and I, I wasn't going to talk about this, but you know, it's 7.8 million acres of fee land. Um, it really is a dominant position. It's 100% ownership surface to basement. Uh, petroleum, natural gas, and coal, uh, as well as any other minerals that come out of there. Um, for representative purposes in the U.S., um, there's a lot of talk about Viper and some of the other uh, U.S. royalty companies. They don't have that same type of land position. I think I looked at Viper's deck and at about 15,500 net acres of land, although it is getting drilled very heavily today. But not a lot of running room and, and really no ability to generate this type of business, which we think is very, very important for shareholders going forward. And it's why we've put a lot of our money in this business. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Amber, who's going to talk about our other revenue. Thank you. So aside from royalty production revenue, we also collect revenue from a number of different streams, most of which are generated from our fee lands. And these can vary significantly from period to period, as you can see in the chart to my right. The bright blue bar on the bottom of the chart represents lease rentals. Lease rentals are paid up front for the primary term of the lease, and then annually after that as the lease is continued. You can think of lease rentals like apartment rent. And as long as the tenant continues to occupy the space, rent is due annually. The dark blue bar represents bonus consideration. The bonus consideration is an upfront fee that's paid on the execution of a new lease. It's similar to what is paid to the government on the acquisition of a new crown lease. It can vary significantly from lease to lease. Um, the terms of the lease may drive the per hectare amount. Might be the area, might be the zone. There's a number of reasons why bonus consideration can be different from from play to play. And you'll notice in 2017 that large increase in the bonus consideration was really driven by the increased Duvernay activity that period. The light gray bar represents our other income streams, really a, a minor piece of our other revenue. But captured in there would be non-performance fees, some pipeline tariff, sulfur revenues that we receive. And the bright orange bar represents compliance recoveries. So when we do receive compliance recoveries, they are reported as royalty production revenue in our financial statements. They relate to royalties, um, and mostly as PPAs, which I'll discuss next. But just wanting to illustrate here that since IPO, the, the average compliance recovery has been about $10 million a year. So prior period adjustments, PPAs, every oil and gas company has PPAs. Um, whenever you have a revenue or a volume amount that's different than amount that's previously been reported, you get a PPA. So we don't operate any of our own wells. We do rely on operator information and public data in order to make our revenue accruals. We're typically paid two months after the production comes out of the ground. And so we do need to make estimates on the volume and the price in order to make those revenue accruals. We use a systematic monthly approach in order to come up with those estimates. But when volumes or prices come in that are different than what we estimated, you get a PPA. We think of PPAs in two buckets. We have compliance PPAs and trending PPAs. Compliance PPAs are really generated from our compliance department. They look at what they expected we were going to get paid for a certain period, and they compare that to what we were actually paid, or in some cases, never received payment. And then they follow up. 
So these can arise because the royalty rate was potentially wrong in the, the lessee's calculation. Maybe they're using excessive deductions in their calculation. There's a number of reasons why what we thought we were going to get paid is different than what we actually received. Trending PPAs can arise um, due to timing. They capture new wells on stream. can be different uh, days on production. So if the well didn't operate for the entire month, that can affect the volumes that we received. It can also be because the well performance was better than we expected when we, we estimated the revenue at the time. PPAs can also affect price. So we're paid by over 340 different payers. They're selling their products to different markets, and we need to make an estimate on what that revenue will look to us before we actually receive that payment. So there can be adjustments that affect just the revenue component, can affect just the volume, they can affect both. But when you have all of that added together, it can have quite a noticeable effect on the realized price that we might report in any given period. So, and I'll pass it on to Pam to talk about the royalty production revenue. Thank you, Amber, for that overview. It's really royalty revenue that drives our cash flow. In 2018, we generated $248 million in royalty revenue. And we generated $66.5 million in the first quarter. Royalty revenue is primarily made up of oil production and oil revenues, which represented 40% of production and over 70% of revenue in the first quarter. We don't give guidance. But in working through the playbook, you'll have an opportunity to review production and activity on the plays. Given our extensive land base, we have across Western Canada, including where we see significant capital being allocated today, we expect to see oil, oil growth over the next three, five, and 10 years. This is evidenced by our increasing uh, proportion of industry capital over our, our lands. When we um, think about oil growth, we're looking at an environment that is $60 WTI and differentials like we've seen in the first part of 2019 or normalized averages. We may see some variability from quarter to quarter like we do now with curtailments, but when we look forward, we think that we have access to the key plays in the basin. We've broken down our production into this slide that represents about 80% of our total barrels. The first one, the Viking, is the most economic, or one of the most economic plays in North America. Due to its quick payouts, we've continued to see activity on this play in a low WTI environment, below $50, as well as continuing today. We have significant inventory in both Alberta and Saskatchewan, with over 6,000 fee locations and over, over 3,000 gore locations. Current oil production is just over 3,000 barrels a day. And it's been flat to up over the last three years, and we continue to uh, expect that kind of uh, activity on our lands into the, next, into the future in the near term and longer term. The operators on these plays have good balance sheets, and they can support continued activity or incre increasing activity. We've divided the Manville into two categories in the playbook, Manville Oil and Manville Medium Heavy Oil. To begin, man, uh, medium and heavy manville oil in Saskatchewan has seen increased production since our last playbook, but we have seen a decline in central Alberta. It's worth noting that in the playbook, Onion Lake is combined in the medium and heavy oil, and in central Alberta, Lindbergh is included. But for the purposes of this slide, uh, we've excluded those two plays. Production in this play totals 1,150 barrels a day in 2018. Given current leasing activity, including some SAG D leasing in Saskatchewan that we've done recently, we would expect that this production would remain flat or grow in the future at current pricing. The Manville oil production play in central and, and uh, southern Alberta covers both medium and light oil production. That production averaged 815 barrels a day in 2018. We've seen significant growth in central Alberta on this play, but we have seen a decline in southern Alberta. Increased in uh, activity in central Alberta has been led by some private and well-capitalized public companies. In southern Alberta, many of the active operators have more challenging debt levels, and we have seen a receivership, which Cam talked about earlier, and that's resulted in lower activity. Overall, in the near term, we expect the combined play to be flat to down in the near term. Both Onion Lake and Lindbergh have seen increased production since we acquired them in late 2016, early 2017. 
Lindbergh production at the end of 2018 was over 18,000 barrels a day, and it's continued at that level into uh, Q1 2019. And that's from 15,000 barrels a day when we acquired it in early 2017. Onion Lake, when we acquired it, was producing 8,500 barrels a day of production. Um, in September of last year, they reached a high of over 12,800 barrels a day prior to shutting in production due to low pricing. Um, in International Petroleum Corporation, which is now the owner of that, of that project, has said that they intend to bring production back up to over 12,000 barrels a day and have the potential to bring that production up to over 14,000 barrels a day with facility optimization. Pengrove has discussed uh, increasing production there to 35,000 barrels a day by 2023, but of course that will depend on WTI pricing and access to capital. The unit production on our property uh, averaged around 800 barrels a day in 2018. Um, we have seen a lot of activity on, this, on, on units on our lands. The units include the Elnora Nisku pool where we've seen a decline of about 470 barrels a day from 2016 when we did our initial playbook to today. Overall, given the level of activity, we do expect unit production to be flat um, as new wells on stream offset declines. The Clearwater and the Duvernay are where we expect to see the most significant increase in our production. Maria spent a lot of time talking about uh, the potential growth um, over the next three, and five, uh, three, five, and ten years, so you can understand the potential there. Combined, these plays averaged 160 barrels a day of production in 2018, but the Duvernay peaked at 260 barrels a day in December and 325 BOE per day, and the Clearwater produced just 28 barrels a day in 2018. We have seen some new wells come on stream there, though, um, and February production was actually 66 barrels a day. Finally, the remaining other plays, they're extensive and they include plays such as the Cardium, Bakken, and Montney, as well as future opportunities that we may not currently be assessing. Production volumes in these plays will really depend on oil prices and producer access to capital. Overall, we expect to see reserves replaced by activity on our land, as they have been year over year, and with WTI and differentials at these levels, oil production to grow. Now we'll move on to natural gas. So natural gas production made up almost half of our production in the first quarter, but only 17% of revenue. All of the activity we've seen on natural gas has been for liquids rich natural gas, as you would expect. And NGL volumes added another 2,600 barrels a day to our production in the first quarter and $9.1 million in revenue. Although natural gas has not contributed uh, to revenue very significantly over the last couple of years, and we don't expect it to over the next, uh, in the near term, uh, we think over the medium to longer term, there are some really interesting projects underway that could help natural gas pricing, including coal to natural gas uh, conversion for electricity, LNG offtake, petrochemical plants, and debottlenecking on current pipelines. Because we own our fee land in perpetuity, we'll be able to participate in any of that upside at no cost to Prairie Sky. So this is a slide that many of you would be familiar with, but we think to really understand the royalty business, you have to understand our margins. So on this slide, we compare ourselves to an operator. We have 98% operating margins as compared to the operator. We have no operating costs, no capital costs, and no back-end environmental liabilities. So all the cash flow that we generate is available for dividends, share buybacks, and acquisitions. Moving on to taxes. Coming into 2019, we had just under $1.5 billion of tax pools. The majority of those tax pools were Canadian oil and gas expense, which is deductible at 10% per year. So what that means for 2019 is that we have $148 million of tax shelter. So the first $148 million of cash flow that we generate is tax-free, and every dollar after that is taxed at 27%. With the new UCP government in Alberta, our provincial taxes are expected to decrease by 4% over the next four years, bringing the provincial rate in Alberta down to 8% from 12% in 2022. That will bring overall corporate rates for Prairie Sky down from 27% to around 23.5% to 24%, depending on the provincial weighting of revenue. Our cash flow forecasts that Andrew is going to walk through at the end of the presentation don't include any adjustments for this tax reduction because they haven't yet been legislated. But we do expect the first 1% decrease to be in place by July 1st. Over the next 10 years, that's going to mean significant cash flow savings for Prairie Sky. 
in the flat production scenario that Andrew will walk through at the end, um, the tax savings that we would see would be $55 million. Tax is one of our largest cash expenses. Our approach to income taxes is to look for opportunities, but to minimize risk. Finally, my last slide I wanted to walk through returns. We wanted to compare ourselves to other th uh, three other great businesses that have duration like we do. So we've compared ourselves here to Franco Nevada, Enbridge, and TC Energy. Along the top in the calculation, we've used net income. You can see, like Franco Nevada, who doesn't use a lot of debt, and we don't use, a lot of debt, and we don't use any debt, um, you can see the return on equity and the return on assets are very similar, and, which is very different, obviously, than the pipeline companies that use much, a lot of debt. The return on capital employed is our highest metric, but because we are a cash taxpayer, we think that you should use after-tax metrics to compare us to our peers. Below, we've uh, included adjusted return on equity assets, capital employed, and invested capital. We've talked about this um, to many of you in the past, but we think it's important to add back depletion uh, to the calculation of the returns for Prairie Sky. Depletion is meant to represent the cash costs to keep your production uh, flat. But of course, we won't incur any of those, cash, uh, any of those uh, cash costs. Those will be incurred by the producer. We don't have to issue debt. We don't have to issue capital to grow. We have that all available in our fee lands. We just need to lease. So um, we can even see here on the bottom, using those adjusted returns, that at the bottom of the cycle, our returns are very compelling. I'll now turn it over to Andrew, who's going to discuss valuation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pam, and uh, uh, I'll talk about valuation, potential returns, and a range of different outcomes. But before I finish the last few valuation slides and uh, potential outcomes, I just wanted to acknowledge the amount of work our team has done to build this playbook. We have no IR folks at Prairie Sky. We have no corporate communications staff. And uh, Pam's been at the office for 35 straight days, including holidays and weekends. So um, really appreciate all the hard work. And uh, I know it's only once every two years, but uh, just wanted to acknowledge that. Oops. Um, you know, a, a number of people on the sell side and buy side have compared Prairie Sky to a number of the new, newly created roll-up strategies you're seeing emerging in the U.S. And, and these, are, these are pure royalty businesses. They're wonderful businesses, uh, high-margin businesses. Um, so people just kind of try and compare them by just looking at a spreadsheet. And, and you do miss a few things when you look at a spreadsheet. I think uh, both Cam and Pam highlighted some of those differences. And some even have similar, similar multiples to ours. Uh, above is a comparison of Prairie Sky and Viper Energy, uh, similar market caps, uh, comparing our businesses over the first quarter. Um, so one of the interesting things, you know, we both paid our dividend. They paid 63 million U.S. in dividends. We paid uh, 45.6 million. We also... Uh, put about $5 million in the bank, canceled $6 million worth of stock. But the two major differences over the quarter are they made 39 acquisitions for $83 million U.S. Um, and we entered into 27 different leases of land we already owned and received bonus consideration. So one business is buying land and issuing shares, and the other business is leasing land and canceling shares. So they are different businesses, and I think uh, it's worth highlighting. And again, they're, they're a wonderful high-margin business. They just... Uh, if they don't continue to roll up new assets, uh, they'll, they'll be a, a true MLP. Um, this, is, uh, this is a slide that uh, I've always kind of liked to look at. Um, it's Prairie Sky versus the uh, risk-free rate in Canada. Um, we're at the widest we've ever traded versus the risk-free rate. I know people talk a lot about paired trades, and it looks to me like it would be a good opportunity to go long Prairie Sky and short the 10-year at 1.67%. Um, our favorite royalty trade is the Texas Hedge, where you go long Franco Nevada and Prairie Sky. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit of, more about their multiple. But this is just more anecdotal. And, and, and what's interesting to me is I would think our spread would be the widest at a time when industry capex was a little higher and a little frothier, and there was more risk inherent, uh, more risk inherent in the underlying business. Um, this is uh, showing our multiple versus uh, our favorite comparable, which is Franco Nevada. And why we compare the, ourselves to Franco is we think they're one of the uh, best-run businesses in the royalty space. Um, and this highlights our multiple compression. We hope we can catch up uh, to them over the next few years. And why do, believe, why do we believe that's fair? Um, the, the major reason is most of our growth over the next 10 and 15 years is prepaid. Uh, a lot of those undeveloped lands we've uh, purchased, like the Clearwater, uh, some of the Duvernay we already had, uh, currently don't generate revenue, but they're a huge part of our future, future income stream. So uh, we believe that over time we uh, think we can improve our multiple. 
Um, this, is, uh, this is a slide. Um, I received this data from a cell side research firm who uh, highlights this. And you know, often people say that they'll never argue that Prairie Sky is one of the best business models. And going through our quarterly financials, um, you can kind of see that. But they say it's expensive. Uh, so we hear expensive, expensive, expensive. And much is made of our EV over debt adjusted cash flow multiple compared to EMP companies. What's interesting is once you back out sustaining capital, the multiples actually look very similar. Um, if you take industry sustaining capital over a period of time, and this is before we even get into differences in balance sheets, differences in inventory quality, differences in inventory quantity, and back end environmental environmental liabilities that we have none of. So we actually believe Prairie Sky is a, a very cheap inexpensive way to, to play a very long-term, long-duration business. Um, this is how we perform relative to the XEG. Now, as a reminder, I, I'm sure 90% of the people in this room know this, but uh, the XEG is now comprised 50% of CNRL and Suncor. So this is per, uh, basically comparing Prairie Sky to CNRL and Suncor. Um, over the last five years, we've almost tracked it one-to-one. -one, and you see the separation we've made from the EMPs there for a while. And we thought that um, that would continue. And, and that's certainly what we've seen with Franco and the gold index, just because we are a higher margin business. We don't require equity and debt uh, to run our business. Uh, but that's just our overall performance in five years' time. And hopefully, we can show you over the next few years how we separate ourselves there. Um, there are REITs in our peer group. And we do feel like there are some similarities in, in the two businesses. So we thought we'd provide some comparisons. Um, so uh, there's four different REITs in Prairie Sky uh, we used. Um, the funds flow metrics, and what's interesting is they traded a very similar free cash flow, um, free cash flow multiples, but the major difference is debt. And if these REITs, REITs all shut off their dividend to pay down their debt to zero, uh, to have the same capital structure as Price Guy, it would take, um, as you can see up there, between 11 and uh, 17 years to pay down the debt to zero. And at that period of time, if we turned our uh, buyback or our uh, uh, dividend off, we could cancel 60% of our shares and just just over 10 years. So again, I think if you think these are the correct multiples for REITs, then we should trade at a greater premium. Um, this is just uh, comparing dividend yields across a number of sectors in uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange. And again, if you can see uh, all these sectors have been uh, total dividends plus share repurchases. And you see how Prairie Sky is relative to uh, all the different uh, subsectors in the TSX. What's interesting is, again, this is not debt adjusted. And this is one of, you'll hear a recurring theme here. But if you debt adjusted this, you'd obviously see uh, our free cash flow multiple go, go up substantially. We, we think, uh, I'll talk about it, two reasons why we never use debt leverage uh, at the very end. But uh, we think it's a very competitive dividend yield today. Um, Pam worked this up. And we have everything from the 22,000 scenario, um, which is flat production for the next decade, to modest growth, 2 to 5% growth on the far ends. Um, and then also we have a declining scenario in $40 oil, which you, you get the $1.4 billion of free cash flow and as high as almost your market cap on the, uh, on the far bottom right. What's interesting here is uh, you know, one simple way to think about this is we did $230 million of free cash flow last year. Analysts have us at about $230 million this year. So just multiply that by 10, that's $2.3 billion. So I think that's you know, a pretty reasonable range uh, to think about this business. So the reason I'm providing this is this is the matrix of potential free cash flow generation on the, in the various scenarios. The one assumption we have here is $1.50 ACO forever, which again is below full cycle F&D costs. So gas would provide future optionality, as would any new discovery or even modest growth. Um, so you know, Prairie Sky will always be a strong dividend paying company. Um, for simplicity's sake, we use all the free cash flow to cancel shares, which also approximates you reinvesting your dividends. And we showed the potential outcomes of share price year 11, assuming a 5% free cash flow yield. So of course, if, you, if we traded a 4% free cash flow yield, all these numbers would be higher, or 6%, they'd all be lower. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the assumptions that went into this and why it's not always realistic when you're looking at the future. And it, uh, but again, we think they're pretty reasonable assumptions. So one of the reasons we don't use debt leverage in the business is obviously for optionality and to take advantage of the downturns. Uh, that, that's a major reason because in any business where there's a lot of debt, you'd have to have a range of outcome that went to zero because that's a reality if you do have debt. And that's one of the reasons we don't use debt is for the capital preservation component of owning our equity. We try and lessen the risk there. Now, we could have obviously enhanced total returns with, uh, by using debt leverage, but we think it's uh, not just important for the way we run the business and taking advantage of downturns, but uh, also for not having that range of outcome to zero. Uh, the highest range of outcome here is exaggerated because in this assumption, we just cancel shares at the current share price. 
Um, so, of course, if you had $80 WTI and a 5% growth rate, you'd be canceling shares at higher share prices. So this $176 number is not realistic. Um, so the two things I wanted to point people to are the orange and the blue line. So the blue line is uh, kind of where we're at today. So it, it represents $60 WTI and zero growth in our business over the next decade. And then the orange line is uh, $70 WTI and a 2% growth rate or 2% compounded growth rate in production um, over the next decade. And uh, those represent $34 per share in the blue. And then the other range, the higher one, is $60 per share, which is an 8% compounded growth rate versus the blue line, which is a 6% compounded growth rate. So for using extremely low growth rates uh, over the next 10 years, we still believe there's uh, a good, good risk-adjusted returns to be had. And just in closing on this slide, uh, future outcomes will never be as clean as a graph like this will predict, of course. Uh, there will be ups and downs. Um, we hope that um, we work really hard to take advantage of those ups and downs for you. Um, and so in times of plenty, we'll try and build cash on top of the dividend and buyback for that rainy day, which always it seems to have been raining for the last four years. Um, but we believe that the Clearwater and Duvernay, which you own, and um, as a shareholder and currently don't generate a lot of cash flow, provide great growth opportunities for shareholders when capital returns to more normalized levels. So we, we do believe there may even be some upside to these, uh, what I would call fairly conservative estimates of, of uh, future returns. Um, so I guess in closing, I just wanted to say thank you all very much for taking the time. I know, I know everyone's busy, um, and, and so we really appreciate um, the time you guys take to understand our business better. Hopefully you get some new information out of those playbooks, and we're always happy over the next month or two to uh, come visit you and walk you through any questions you have, uh, both in terms of the valuations, but also in terms of what you read in the playbooks. Um, I'll now open it up to any questions people have. Yes, sure. Yeah, you touched on, on the, the taxation uh, briefly and just mentioned, you know, with, with COGP and the CDs. I mean, the one thing the industry uh, from the producer side has been good at is generating tax losses um, over the last 15, 20 years. Is there anything you can do when, let's say, a situation goes bad like Manitowoc where you can cut somehow systematically reduce your taxation? Because that is your highest expense, right, on a, on a cash <coughs> basis. It is, and actually, we've spent a lot of time looking at the tax side, and I think you know it would add a tremendous amount of value. And certainly, a, a private like Ontario Teachers pays no provincial or corporate income tax, so their their advantage. So we did um, go to the federal government uh, to try and convert our business to a REIT. Uh, we believe there's no proliferation issues because we're the only company like us in Canada. Um, but again, it, you know, they they disagreed. They agreed with our thesis, but they disagreed <laughs> with us paying lower taxes. So that was one, one structural change that we, we wouldn't have enacted that. Um, there was, you know, some tax advisors said you, you should just do it and, or, and work on it later. Um, but we, wanted, we didn't want to provide that kind of risk for our shareholders. And then on the other side, the producing assets or money that was destroyed in the oil sands or money that was destroyed in other parts of the basin, um, we really believe that there's a lot of risk with those. Um, they continue to come back uh, on those transactions. You look at Silver Wheaton did some tax transactions to save couple hundred million dollars, lost a billion dollars off their market cap uh, when the CRA called. Uh, our closest, you know, uh, some of our neighbor, one of a smaller competitor, uh, has a similar issue that's now arisen and you spend time, money on it. Um, so again, we, and, and in a lot of cases, Norm, you actually have to add well bores or, or liabilities into your business to be able to continue on that business and we're just not willing to take those kind of risks. But it's, uh, it's something we think about all the time and as a private, um, if this was privatized, um, then you'd never have another dollar in tax again. As a partnership, you could flow, flow through the income. Can you talk a little bit about, um, can you grow with the egress situation that's existing in, in uh, Canada now? And uh, the other question I have is just related to dips, uh, which was just why you, uh, uh, you I think you, talked about current diffs, which are, are pretty tight relative to futures, and just wanted to talk about what the thinking was there. Yeah, and I think where our assets are located, we think we can grow, even if the egress situation doesn't improve on the oil side, just because we have more competitive barrels um, that should replace declining barrels in other parts of the basin. But it would be uh, modest uh, growth, so we are really hopeful that some, some of these solutions happen. Uh, the two benefits, the major benefits we'll have if you do get egress out of the basin, number one would be, um, obviously, producers would receive a better net back, so we'd receive a better net back as well. So that's one positive. Number two is they'd be able to spend more capital 
um, and have more cash flow. So it would be a big positive, but we do think it's possible on the oil side anyway to grow our volumes modestly uh, without additional egress. And then on the differentials, one of the things we use in all our assumptions is kind of more historic uh, differentials, um, $17, Pam. So kind of we, we just took historical averages, and I don't know if that's conservative or regressive, but uh, that's just the past data we had. Um, and again, there's a lot of different moving parts with differentials, and this is that's just a long ways from expertise, both pricing and uh, the offsets. So I, I'd be wrong if I told you any analysis I had in the future. Jeremy, sorry, it's, I'm looking into the sun here. On the, on the overall upside that you guys were talking about, like I know you mentioned in the playbook the clear water is only 13% of all the inventory that you potentially have. If you look at all your plays, have you done a similar analysis? Like how much is a playbook only capturing today across everything? And then when you look at the type curves as well, you said the Duvernay looks like it could be a lot higher in terms of overall recovery. Like how much conservatism do you have in this playbook here on some of the other stuff that wasn't talked about? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the five-year trailing type curve one is probably the biggest piece of conservatism on the existing assets. And the reason for that is because there's been so little drilling in the basin in the last two years. You're taking an arithmetic average of all the wells drilled in the last five years when there was higher drilling activity and poor technology. So we think there's growth in, uh, in the type curves. Number two, of course, we've removed almost all the gas. And so that's not worth zero. Um, it's worth something, but it's valued at zero in our playbook. And, and we do look at the potential, and there have been some new discoveries on the Clearwater that aren't, of course, in there. Um, so again, the one example I used, Jeremy, is the in that navy blue wedge, the wedge that doesn't, you know, we don't put any future value. It's not part of the 15.2 billion undiscounted number. Um, in that navy blue wedge, that was 10% of the drilling activity since our last playbook was generated. So um, you, you know, you continue to have new discoveries that we couldn't contemplate today. Um, so that. We do believe there's a lot of conservatism baked in, and I think that's why you'll see sequential increases in the valuation um, every couple of years as we return you know, half a billion dollars, and then we'll look at the closing balance of what the business is worth at the end of that two-year period when we release the 2021 playbook. Travis. Yeah, thank you. Just kind of related to that, on the, on the Duvernay, what's embedded on the cost front? Uh, we've heard a lot of variability in, in cost, real complete tie-in from the Duvernay. So what's embedded in that total value? It's a good question. And, and um, so there's no cost embedded in it for us. Um, so, but I will, I will touch on why the cost is important. It's a very good uh, point you bring up. Um, because we don't have any of the costs associated with dr drilling it, we just have the end result. Um, but the cost is massively important in terms of the pace of development and in terms of the recycling of cash in the play. Um, and we do get well data on, um, I think we got 780 wells last year across the entire basin, ranging from Royal Dutch Shell down to the small producers. So we see cost data on every play. So we have a pretty good flavor for it. And, you know, we've seen costs on a development scenario, and the Duvernay is low. Uh, if you go down to the Ghost Pine abatement, where it's shallowest, and, you know, they drill the wells in seven, eight days, um, we've seen costs as low as $5 million, all in, um, including surface acquisition right through to the production facilities. And we've actually recently had two wells drilled on our lands uh, where the costs were in the range of $20 million. Um, It's a lot of hydrocarbon that needs to be produced to pay that well out, or those two wells out. Um, now, having said that, if you can, it, you know, there's, these are early stage plays, so um, we hope there's more to be done on the cost side. And most of the things that have been drilled on our uh, Duvernay acreage have been single well tests, and they do a lot of, they do cores in the Duvernay. They, um, test the hydrodynamics, they send all the information to labs in the U.S., specialized shale labs. So these are costs that we think you know, pr probably don't perpetuate forever, but, uh, it's, uh, but for us, we don't use costs because we don't have any. Yes, Aaron. Thanks. I'll re-ask a question I asked, I think, two years ago now. Under a normalized development scenario, what discount rate would I have to apply to your, call it, build-up scenario to get to your current share price? Right, so if you uh, it'd be about a 5.7% discount rate at today's drilling activity, which is a very low level of uh, drilling activity. So um, the real question is, you know, we have 22,000 well bores in that, um, in that $15.2 billion. So it is, it is a great question. You know, what's a, there's a time value to money. What discount rate do you use to get your current share price? And where's the upside past that? So a lot of the upsides are a faster pace of development 
uh, obviously is one. Two is we always add new wells to that as people make new discoveries. Um, and, and in addition, any advances in technology increase the EURs and that number grows. So I, I think, Pam, it's... and other revenues, including uh, cash tax expenses. And maybe a related follow-up question. When you think about... And I think last time it was, the answer to your question was 3.7 3. 3. or 3 point, and that was just because our share price was much better. <laughs> so when you think about making acquisitions, do you have an internal IRR hurdle rate that you would target? Yeah, so when we work up any acquisition um, and we, we build a discounted cash flow model, we're usually t uh, targeting low double-digit returns, like 11, 13, 14 uh, percent, but we're hoping that we build not only conservative uh, drilling activity, but there's also undeveloped land that provides upside on top of that. Um, you know, because it's been almost straight down in terms of activity, um, we've run pretty conservative models, and actually the, probably the oil sands development scenarios that we've, uh, from the Lindbergh side have been too aggressive, so we probably erred there, and we probably uh, you know, given today's development potential on that, it probably bought it down to a very low discount rate. Uh, but some, because we put such a low level of drilling activity, probably would, would have exceeded those, uh, those numbers. And, and, you know, a lot of the discounted cash flow analysis is only one piece of it. And because if you're buying some cash flows over the next 10 years that are declining, which we see a lot of assets that look like that, um, you know, you obviously have to buy those really, really well and at a very good uh, you've got to get your money back very quickly because they're diluting your ultimate asset base because they don't have the optionality or upside. Sure. One more question for me, sir, I guess. When you think about making acquisitions or entering these land fund arrangements at sort of low double-digit IRRs, how do you weigh that relative to buying back your own stock? Yeah, and that's where there's a little more art than science involved, and the Clearwater would be a good example of that. It was really hard to build up a scenario and uh, an IRR because the, it, it hadn't been discovered on those lands yet. Um, but we took all the analogies that the producer showed us, and we basically, I, I think, Pam, we used 10% of the acreage um, working in a very conservative development scenario, and it was, a, it was I think, a 12% error. And that was using $55 WTI. So even if a small portion of it worked, we were getting a reasonable rate of return at uh, a very low oil price. So we thought that made sense. Um, but the land funds are a little different. They're more partnerships, and we typically partner with well-capitalized businesses that have no debt. They have their own money in the business, and they already have a well-defined play that we think will recycle cash fast enough that they don't require equity and debt. So we get shown a lot of them, and we um, only do a handful. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, well... Oh. Just to follow up on Aaron's questions there. So if you're looking at acquisitions here for 2019, are you more inclined to buy existing GORES from other operators or more create your own GORES here? And if you just want to uh, comment a bit more on the Northeast BC Montney stuff that you have as well too, and just in terms of is that going to be a play that we think could be in 2021, the, 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 the new up and coming play that you see here? Yeah, so um, I'll talk about the money separately. And when we look out this year, of course, it's never clear what will come available. But uh, most of the opportunities we see don't compete with us buying back shares. It's always better to cancel more shares and own more of your existing business that you know very well um, than take risks uh, on the M&A side. So the majority of the acquisitions we're, we've been conducting lately and probably see out in the future, smaller land fund arrangements where you spend $2 million on a block of land and the producer commits capital because you think there's uh, good upside there. So kind of smaller ones that you do out of your free cash flow on top of the dividend to buy back. And then in terms of the Montney, um, you know, we think we're, we're, pretty ex we're, we're pretty fortunate, I should say, uh, Cam, that you know, Cam worked really hard on that deal. It took about a year and a half working with them. Um, we're fortunate that they made a big uh, oil discovery on it because there was some risk involved there. I was actually particularly nervous about exposing $12 million of shareholders' money w without a well into it, but the geology and the engineering supported that there was probably an accumulation there and there was five stacked horizons, so we figured that one or two of them might work. Um, their well was exceptional. They're obviously uh, a smaller company that they've never used debt either, and they own a meaning, meaningful share of their business, but they certainly don't have the capitalization to drill a lot of, to drill a lot of wells, so it would have to be some kind of uh, scenario where they were acquired or they were, had access to more capital before I think I saw a major development there. Um, but their first well, which I think tested uh, close to 800 barrels of true crude oil, um, is going to go on production uh, by Q3. 
and we'll get better data from that. So understand its potential. So we're going to be around for a little while. If anyone has any further questions, uh, obviously we introduced uh, some of our board members and they'd be happy to uh, answer any of your questions as well. And just want to thank everyone for coming and hopefully we can uh, continue to show you positive developments when we release our 2021 playbook. Thank you.